Good morning, everyone. Good morning. And uh, welcome to session three, our third session, uh, titled, How Do We Prepare Future Faculty to Enhance the Success of All Students? My name is David Dalecki, and I'm Vice Provost for Graduate Education and Associate Dean at Indiana University. And our co-moderator today is uh, Jennifer Stanford from uh, Drexel University. Um, my role here is to introduce our plenary speaker and to manage a couple of questions, and then I do, and then Jennifer's going to do all the heavy lifting for the rest of the session today. Um, but it's my pleasure to introduce our final plenary um, speaker of the forum, David Asai, who's Senior Director, <coughs> excuse me, for Science Education at the Howard Hughes Medical Institute. David earned his bachelor's degree in chemistry from Stanford University, go Cardinal, and his PhD in biology from Caltech. After completing postdocs at Caltech and the University of California, Santa Barbara, he joined the Purdue uh, faculty of Purdue University. And there he served as head of biological sciences and established a research program focused on the structural and functional diversity of dining which is a cytoskeletal motor protein that transports cargo and drives movement within cells. After 18 and a half years at Purdue, and I have to ask him about why it's 18 and a half, uh, he moved, very specific, he moved to Harvey Mudd College, which as you know is a STEM-focused institution with a strong reputation for educational innovation as the Stuart Mudd Professor and Chair of Biology. And then after five years there, he came to HHMI in 2008. At HHMI, David's team creates and leads grants and fellowship programs aimed at the development of students in science, and current initiatives under his direction are designed to promote undergraduate research experiences, build diversity and inclusion, and recognize accomplished faculty who contribute to expanding undergraduate research opportunities and to innovate innovative science education. We are fortunate to have David here with us today to share his thoughts about the future of STEM education and the disproportionate loss of underrepresented students in STEM disciplines. So please join me in welcoming David aside to the podium. Good morning. I uh, appreciate the opportunity to, to be with you today, and um, I want to apologize for not being here earlier. I, we just got back from France for, for vacation in, in Paris, and um, actually while we were there, uh, we went, spent a day up at the Normandy beaches where D-Day happened. It was about the same time that our president was uh, arguing that the reason that we need not support the Kurds in Syria is because they weren't there for us at D-Day. Um, nevertheless, uh, so I wanted to see uh, the beaches of Normandy. You know, that happened 75 years ago in June of 1944. About six days after D-Day, uh, the U.S. Congress passed a very important law, the Servicemen's Readjustment Act of 1944, or the GI Bill. The GI Bill was intended to help all of the returning veterans coming back from World War II to get reestablished in American and, and really to, to build up their own, uh, their own personal wealth. In fact, the GI Bill was largely responsible for what we now call the middle class. The GI Bill provided a number of different benefits to, to, benef to, to, to veterans, including uh, uh, educational uh, loans as well as housing loans. There were 16 million veterans who were eligible for the GI Bill after World War II. 16 million people coming back from the war actually represented one out of every nine Americans, men, women, and children of all ages. So this was a massive fraction of the U.S. population. And so the impact of the, of, of the GI Bill was, was really terrific. It, it was a huge opportunity for this, this large prop, population of people and therefore an opportunity for this country. You know, in the educational, in the educational sector, for example, about 8 million persons took advantage of the GI Bill. In 1947, 
couple years after the end of the war, 49% of all college students in the United States were veterans. In the housing uh, realm, this was also very important. Something like 2.7 or 2.8 million veterans took advantage of the housing loans. And uh, this was a time when uh, the urban centers of this country really sort of changed and a lot of folk moved out to the suburbs. This happened in Philadelphia, for example. So a place called Levittown, just 26 miles north of Drexel, emerged as a suburb really to, 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 to Philadelphia. Levittown was built by the Levitt brothers. There are other Levittowns. There's a very famous one on Long Island. And in Levittown, in Pennsylvania, I think something like 17,300 homes were built in a span of six years. So that's huge. If my arithmetic is correct, that's something like 60 houses a week that was being built. For 400 bucks, a person can now get into home ownership. And this, in turn, was a huge opportunity for America because this really, as I said, established the middle class. People now began to be able to accumulate wealth and equity in their homes and through education. So it was a, it was a great opportunity. But like all opportunities, or like many opportunities, there were also missed opportunities. And the missed opportunity for America in, in, in terms of the GI Bill was that of the 16 million veterans who came back, most of them were men, one million were African American. And the, the sort of the, the genius of the Congress at the time, the, the Congress was run by Southern Democrats. And so what they realized was that they could be equal, people could be equally, they, they could re realize the benefits equally. It didn't matter if you were black or white, you, had, you, you could get the same benefits. But the system was not inclusive because the GI Bill said that here's the money, the federal government will provide these loans for housing, for education, but it will be operated locally. And so in terms of education, most of the colleges and, and, and universities, especially the large state universities in this country, had not yet accepted any blacks or very few. Even the schools in the north only had a handful of African Americans. I was recently at the University of Georgia. Georgia admitted their first blacks in 1961. The University of Maryland, which is just a couple of miles away from where I work at HHMI, didn't admit their first African Americans until 1951. And so for 95% of the African Americans, veterans who wanted to take advantage of the educational benefits of the GI Bill, 95% of them had to apply for admission to the about 100 HBCUs, the historically black colleges and universities in this country, which are a great resource, but also fairly limited in their capacity. Many of them are very small and perhaps a little bit under-resourced. And so as a result, a large number of African-Americans who wanted to go to college on the GI Bill were simply unable to get into college. In 1947, 20,000 blacks who wanted to go to college on the GI Bill were turned away. And altogether, it's estimated that 55% of all African-American veterans who wanted to go to college on the GI Bill were not able to do so. And so the disparity began to grow, that it, the system was not inclusive for everyone. The same thing happened in housing. In fact, housing, the Levittown that I just talked about, where 17,000 homes were built in the period of six years, that was an all-white community. The Levitt brothers didn't want to sell to African Americans. The same thing happened in the, in, on Long Island and, and, and so forth. And so, in fact, the numbers are staggering in terms of the African Americans who were excluded from the VA loans for, for housing. In Mississippi in 1947, something like 3,800 loans were given in 1947 in Mississippi to veterans on the housing thing, and only two went to African Americans. In the New York City greater area, the metropolitan area, in 1950, 69,666 housing loans were given under the GI Bill, and only 69 went to African Americans. So in fact, what happened was that the disparity between, in, between whites and blacks in terms of home ownership in this country just, just went, out, went through the roof. 
Since 1900, the disparity between whites and blacks owning their own homes had been steadily closing. So by 1940, they were not quite equal, but they were pretty close. But between 1940 and 1960, the disparity in home ownership between whites and blacks more than doubled. And we are still living with the impact of this unequal application of, of the GI Bill. We are still living, I think, with our failure to be an inclusive society at the time when we could have really made a big difference. And so that, to me, is an opportunity missed. Well, you know, in higher education, in STEM higher education, we have the same opportunities. We have a, we have a huge opportunity every year. Something like 2.3 million people come to college every year. Many of them start at community colleges. Over 40% of those 2.3 million want to study STEM. So that's a large number right there. And then, of course, we know that other students who don't intend to study STEM might still take a course or two in science for distribution purposes. And so that's our opportunity. We get this, this, this over a million people every year coming to college, wanting to study science, wanting to study STEM, and we have the opportunity then to help them understand the process of science, to understand how we might use evidence to make decisions, how uh, scientists go through uh, figuring out something, how discoveries might be made. Now, they're not all going to become scientists. That's okay. But the opportunity that we have is that we can influence a large number of people every year in terms of understanding the process because they will go on to vote, they will become parents, they will become teachers, some of them might even become politicians. And so this to me is a, is a huge opportunity and as you appreciate, I think, and this, the whole theme of this, this meeting has continued to bring this up, that the problem that we have is that we are missing that opportunity just as the GI Bill missed an opportunity for America. We too in the STEM higher education community are missing our opportunity. Because you see, we are driving away a large number of young people or people who come to college wanting to study STEM. Over 60% of, of, the, of the students who start off in college wanting to study STEM do not finish in STEM, their baccalaureate degrees. And if they are persons from underrepresented racial and ethnic groups, it is 80% who fail to finish in STEM, their baccalaureate degrees. If you start off at a community college with the intent of transferring to a four-year school to get your baccalaureate, you have a five-fold lower probability of finishing the baccalaureate than a person who starts at a four-year school. If you are a first-generation student, that is a student who, who nobody in your family had gone to college, you have a three-fold lower probability of finishing the baccalaureate than a person who comes from a family with somebody who went to college. And if you are a person from uh, excluded racial and ethnic group, then you have a twofold lower probability of finishing the baccalaureate in STEM than whites and Asians. Now, some might say, well, you know, the reason that we, we have these disparities is because, well, people just aren't interested. But in fact, that's just not true. In terms of the excluded racial and ethnic groups, who come to college wanting to study STEM, they actually are overrepresented amongst the students starting college wanting to study STEM. Some might say, well, it's because they're not prepared, that they want to study, but they're just, they just can't cut it. And it's true that students who are unprepared do poorly in STEM as well as in non-STEM disciplines. But in a recent paper by Catherine Regal Crum and her colleagues, and I invite you to take a look at that paper if you're not familiar with it. They did a, an interesting study which essentially confirmed data that we've known about for at least 20 years. The data that we've known about for 20 years is that persons of color will leave STEM at much higher rates than whites and Asians. But what Regal Crum and her colleagues did was to take this a little bit further, and they asked, why? They asked what's different or what, what, what's, what's going on here. And what they were able to show was that no matter what the discipline, whether it's in STEM or in a non-STEM discipline, uh, non-whites are leaving the discipline at a greater rate than whites. 
But when you correct, when they corrected for preparation, so the math skills, for example, comparing a STEM intending student, a student intending to major in STEM versus a student who intends to major in business, which also requires math skills, if you correct for the math preparation, then the, then the loss of students could be explained in the non-STEM discipline, but in the STEM discipline, there was still a large disparity between non-whites and whites in terms of who finished the, the STEM degree. And so the conclusion might, might be that there's something that's different about STEM, about the disciplines that we represent in this room, and it has little to do or it is not only about the preparation of the students or of where they come from, but rather there is something about the way we behave. Perhaps we're not as inclusive as we should be. Perhaps we want to be equal, but the system is no, not yet inclusive, and so we see inequalities, we see disparities. Most of the leaving occurs in the first year, and so, it seems to me that we might want to take a look at the introductory time in, in, in STEM. As I mentioned, this is a great opportunity for us because this is when we have a large number of people who want to understand how STEM works, and yet we, uh, we're, we're, just, we're just not doing it. So I want to spend the, the, the rest of my few minutes with you talking a little bit about some thoughts about the introductory time. This is not about learning skills of inclusion. This is not about pedagogy. Those things are really important, no question. But I just want to talk about the content and what we do as we build our curricula in the introductory years. Right? So we should learn the skills of inclusion. We should learn about how to talk about differences across differences. We should learn how to listen. We should learn all of those things. We should understand how to, to take this stuff personally. That's important. We should understand how to teach inclusively. That's important. We should understand how to use our pedagogy, like active learning or flipped classrooms or, or whatever. We should learn that stuff too, but that's not what I'm talking about today. I'm just talking about how we build our curriculum, the assumptions that we're making, and what goes into those introductory courses. I'm a biologist. I taught introductory biology for many years, um, 18 and a half years at Purdue. <laughs> And then I taught introductory biology at Harvey Mudd College. I taught to both majors and non-majors in biology. So my perspective is as a biologist. What I'm about to say has mainly to do with how we teach introductory biology. Perhaps there are some similarities in some of the other disciplines represented in this room, but I don't pretend to speak for chemists or mathematicians or physicists or engineers or computer scientists. And so I'm going to suggest that there's a few things that we really ought to be thinking about as we think about our introductory experience. Remember, this is our one opportunity. When we have all of these folks here, most of them are not going to become scientists, but we, can still, have, we still have this opportunity to work with them, to, to help them understand how we think, how to think as scientists. And I think that we should be working hard. Maybe they don't have to love science, but we shouldn't piss them off. And I think that's what we're doing too often. So one of the things that, you know, maybe it doesn't happen at your places, but it certainly happened when I was teaching introductory biology. I felt that one of my jobs was to weed out those who didn't belong. I felt that if I could, yeah, I taught in an auditorium that had 450 people at Purdue, 450 uh, people taking my cell biology course. And I knew that only a few of them are actually gonna become scientists. And so, in fact, they were sitting in the front rows here. Those are the ones that I thought, yeah, they care. I want to teach to them. Them guys way up there, they don't really belong here. It's okay if they leave, right? It doesn't hurt my, my you know, I'm doing, I'm doing a service to my discipline. So I think that our attitude that it's important to weed out people is probably misplaced. As I said, we don't need 450 people at Purdue every year to become a PhD scientist but we ought to at least engage them at some level, knowing that most of them will only take one or two courses and then move on to something else. So there's a few places or a few 
aspects of how we think about our curriculum that I'd just like to, to talk about today. There's three things that I want to just mention. You know, it, it starts with uh, something that um, my friend George Langford, George is at Syracuse University. He used to be Dean of Arts and Sciences. And, and George mentioned to me one day, George is a biologist, and he said, you know, David, um, when I talk with my colleagues in my college, I have both scientists and I have non-scientists. And it's really interesting because at the introductory level, when you are talking, when you're talking about introductory, I don't know, English or poetry, introductory art or music or history, in those disciplines, even at the first level, right, the Art 101 course, what the students are asked to do is they're asked to look at a piece of art or listen to some music or read a book or read a passage and then to think about what it meant to write an essay or to write a paper or whatever, but they're asked to think about whatever they just did. George pointed out that in science, we don't do that. We don't ask our students, what do you think? We ask our students, what do you know? And that's a big difference. So I think our attitude can certainly look, uh, deserve some, some examination. So anyway, so, so three things that, that I think we should be thinking about. The first has to do with prerequisites. You know, when I was teaching biology at Purdue, in order to take my course, the students had to at least have been either co-enrolled or had already passed the chemistry, the introductory chemistry course. And in order to get into that chemistry course, the students had to have or had been co-enrolled in a calculus course. And so we were using calculus as a prerequisite to study biology. Now, as David pointed out or reminded me, many years ago, I majored in chemistry, and I've taught biology for a long time. And while it's true that you need quantitative skills to understand cell biology or chemistry, you really don't need a lot of calculus. You need to understand how to think about measurement, how to think about uh, statistics, perhaps, how to think about data sets and, and, and seeing patterns in data sets and so forth. You even need to be able to measure change with time, which is an aspect of calculus, but you really don't need the level of calculus that our colleagues in mathematics might be teaching our students. So I'm here to tell you not that math and, and quantitative skills I'm not saying that those are not important. They clearly are. But I also think that it's our responsibility as I'm teaching my cell biology course that I should be able to help my students understand the level of quantitative skills that I want them to be able to have as they take my course. And it's important for us not to confuse prerequisites with a proxy for keeping people out. You know, when I was teaching cell biology, there were more things than just quantitative skills I wanted my students to come away with. I wanted them to be able to visualize a structure in three dimensions and think about how that three-dimensional structure led to its function. I wanted them to be able to communicate, to discuss with one another the evidence, to disagree or to critique one another. Yet, we didn't have a prerequisite for them to first have taken an art course so that they could visualize structures, nor did we have a prerequisite for them to have taken the debate and speech course before they could take my biology course. So all of this just to say that I don't know the right answer for prerequisites, but let's make sure that the prerequisite is really uh, there for whatever the student, whatever we want our students to understand, and not, as I said, as a proxy for a barrier to keep some students out. The second thing I'll just mention is that in science, we often have a laboratory course that goes along with the lecture course. So in biology, you've got you know, the lecture, and at the same time, the students are supposed to be taking this, this intro bio lab. Same thing happens in chemistry and physics. 
And often we, we pay a lot of attention to trying to coordinate, right, what goes on in the lecture in the lab. So when they're talking about genetics in the intro course, then in the lab, maybe they'll do a fruit fly little demonstration experiment. Or maybe when we're talking about enzymes in the, in the, in the lecture, then they'll do some sort of a color assay, uh, you know, a, a change. In chemistry, you might do a titration when you're talking about acid base and so forth. And so we believe that that's really important. We believe that those introductory lab courses are so important for the students to understand things. But let's be, let's be clear that those introductory lab courses are not about discovery. They are about getting the right answers that the students, that we already know what the right answers are. In fact, in some disciplines, we worry about the number of significant figures to which they get the right answer. We, uh, HHMI runs something called the CFAGES course. Some of you are familiar with it. So in this course, these are mainly freshmen. They go out, they isolate bacteriophage, viruses that infect bacteria. They characterize their virus. Because every virus is different, they get to name their own virus. We then take their DNA, we, we sequence the genomes of these viruses, we give it back to the sequences back to the students in the second semester, then they annotate the genomes, and they figure out where the genes are, and then they, they write this up. So this is discovery. And we've studied this. this. This has now been going on for 11 years, this project. We have about 5,500 students last year at 125 different schools. And what we know is that the students who take the CFAGES course, as opposed to the introductory lab course in biology at their schools, do better in the lecture course. They, they stay in science. At a, at, at a higher rate, even though there's no connection between the lab that they're taking in the CFAGES project and the lecture. We also know that, excuse me, we also know that the characteristics that are uh, uh, predictive of a student persisting in science, that is identity, self-efficacy, uh, the ability to think as a scientist, community, networking, all of those characteristics are very high among students who take the CFAGES course, much higher than those who take the, the traditional lab courses. And those, those characteristics are high no matter where the student comes from, whether the student, no matter what the gender of the student is, the race ethnicity of the student, the first generation status of the student, what kind of institution this might be, whether it's a community college or a research university, the social economic background of the family, and so forth. And so these discovery-based, course-based research experiences, I think, are something that we ought to be thinking about very, very hard when we think about the experience that we want our students to take in the introductory level. So the last thing I just wanted to mention is the actual content of the lecture course. So the content of the lecture course is often just too much. I would argue that it's, an, it's time for us to blow up the introductory course and start over again. Um, Jen was, uh, she, she provided, provided me the, um, here's, here's, a, here's a textbook that we use in many introductory courses in biology, the Campbell. Uh, book. This is, uh, which edition is this? This is the 10th edition, all right. So there's at least an 11th edition. Um, this, is, this is an amazing book. It's got pretty much everything you'd ever want to know about biology. And if it's not in here, then it'll be in the 12th edition. <laughs> so I'm not dissing this book at all. This is an encyclopedia of information. I just had some statistics about it, in case you're interested. The 11th edition has 56 chapters, 1,284 pages, it weighs 7.6 pounds, <laughs> and it costs $275 online at Target. The problem isn't that, the, that, there's, that there's not good stuff in books like that. The problem is that an encyclopedia is not the same thing as a syllabus. And the students might not understand that difference. And so when we, as instructors, think about how, whatever textbook we're going to use, it's really important that we help our students understand how to use the encyclopedic textbook, if we're, if we're going to have a book like that, as a resource and not as a syllabus. Because otherwise, they're just going to start memorizing everything in there. So we're doing a, a little experiment at, at, at Hughes. There are six of us who work at, at Howard Hughes. and. Um, all of us have taught introductory biology, 
some of us at community colleges, some of us at research universities, some of us at liberal arts colleges. And so we, we decided that uh, we've been working for about a year now, and we decided that what we're going to do is try to put together a syllabus for introductory biology. And, and, and we decided to do sort of three things, and, and, and we don't have the answer, but here's, here's the process by which we're, which, which we're using. And I think the process is really important, and I think it might be something that we might, we might want to get others who teach introductory courses to think about. You see, because it's a group of us, we each have our own perspectives, and it's very fascinating to listen to the conversations because each of us, even though we've all taught the same stuff, we all have very different perspectives. So we have the following rules for our group. It is that our plan is to develop a syllabus for an introductory biology course that will be one semester. It might be part of a sequence, there might be additional semesters, but we can't assume that the students will take more than one semester. Further, we decided that in our one semester course, we're gonna cover all five core concepts in the vision and change document. Some of you are familiar with vision and change. There are five core concepts that we think that all biologists should understand. Evolution, structure and function, energetics, information flow, and systems, living systems. And so we decided that in our one semester, we're gonna cover all five of those concepts. And we decided that this will be for beginning students with no prerequisites, and it could be either for majors or non-majors. And so what our process has been that we, as a group of six, we come together every so often, and we talk about things, and we sort of are approaching this with, okay, here are the five core concepts. What are the learning outcomes for each of these concepts that we really think have to be in this one semester? And a learning outcome then will be a statement of the student should be able to understand or should be able to describe this or that. We then think about, well, so how would we evaluate the student's understanding of these core concepts? And so what would the test questions be? Or what would the exercises be by which we would evaluate their achievement of these, uh, of these learning outcomes? And then finally, uh, we're trying to put it in terms of a, of, a, of a phenomenon or phenomena or perhaps some systems in which we would, then, we would then build this whole thing. And so, I don't know what the right syllabus is for introductory biology, but I do believe that we have to get away from this idea that more is better, that we have to remember that most of the students won't remember any of this stuff anyway, and so it's important for us to emphasize their thinking as opposed to what they, what they know. So, I started off by reminding myself that I had just been in, in Normandy last week. At D-Day, 160,000 troops landed in Normandy, and they had some real characteristics, whether they knew it or not. They were really courageous. It took an incredible amount of, of, of courage to go onto those beaches. They were committed. In fact, this was probably the only battle in in the world's history in which in order to get away from being killed, in order to retreat, you actually had to move forward because they couldn't move backwards because the water was back there. And they were committed to change. I'm not sure how many of them understood the, the impact of what they were doing, but the change, of course, was the liberation of Europe. So courage, commitment, and change are things that we, as faculty, need to also take on. I entitled this talk, Neither Left Nor Right. What I meant was that we should not be leaving behind those whom we have historically left behind. And nor right means that I think our emphasis on getting the right answer is just the wrong way to do things. So I appreciate this opportunity. I'd be happy to take a question or two. I know that we're running out of time, so thank you. Yes, there's a, yes. There's a, I think there's a microphone. Hi, thank you, Dr. Sai. My name is Jaskirat Batra. I'm a grad student at Texas A&M. And first of all, I think this is a great event and a great opportunity. And it's amazing to see that there's a lot of people here who are encouraged by the same dream of seeing academia change. I actually started off my PhD with the hopes of wanting to go into academia. Um, but 
being in the system, you see that you know there's a lot of things that need fixing. And at this conference, we have fo focused a lot about equity and inclusion, but I feel like that conversation is not complete if we don't address the issues of actually trying to bring in people, which is through the accessible cost of the colleges. So this conversation has not touched at all on the tuition and CE, and so should the faculty be playing any role in advocating to their universities and administration on keeping check on the cost rather than waiting for a government to come in and building regulations around the cost of colleges. I mentioned quantitative skills in um, our introductory courses. One of the, one of the things to, to, for faculty, I think, to understand is the uh, financial benefit of teaching well. You know, at many universities and colleges now, the larger driver for the financial well-being of the institution is actually to the tuition and, and fees that you were talking about. So if you keep students in their seats and let and, and if they're fairly happy and so they continue, that's actually a greater be financial benefit than the research dollars that might be coming into a and I don't know the specifics about a and but but it, that, that is beginning to be the case at many places. And so that's a that's a... That's a quantitative sort of analysis that I think all of us should understand, that it's not about uh, teaching is not as important. Uh, you know, you've all talked about that, that it is important, but you can even put dollars, we, we, we can put that in terms of, of, the, of, of the benefits, the financial benefits to the university or to the college. So I don't have an answer to your question. I certainly think that it's important for all of us to engage in thinking about how much students are paying in order to be in our classes. I think that that is important. I'm not sure that many of us are, are in the position where we can actually influence that, except that we should understand that if they are in our classes, that at least no matter how much they're paying, I think they deserve as much as they can get for whatever they're paying in a, in a quality sort of a way. So I, that's my poor answer to your good question. Hey, uh, my name is Gabriel Angrand. Uh, I'm actually a STEM learning instructor, so academic support um, at the University of Pennsylvania. Um, and I want to thank you, Dr. Asai, and everybody else for all these great conversations. Um, so I've been at my position for about a year and a few months, and I've had some really cool conversations with professors um, who I think are very well-intentioned in terms of um, trying to create a very conducive environment for students' learning. Um, but one thing that keeps coming up is this aspect of time. And you know, we think of time as a resource, and so, for some reason it seems like we have to sacrifice our lab time for developing a, a, an environment that's conducive to student, to student learning. And so I just wanted to ask you, um, what were some sacrifices that had to be made, or did that not be, was that not a conversation in terms of what you guys are building um, at HHMI? So could you ask that question? I didn't quite catch the... Yeah, so the, I guess the short, um, short version. Um, did you and, and the, the faculty members that you were working with um, have this conversation about like what you might have had to give up in order to spend time on building something really great for students? Or was it more like this is important enough that we don't even think about it that way? Yeah, so time is obviously always the, the, the big... Uh, the big challenge, and so really the kind of process that we're going through, I would, I would hope that other places could also go through that process, but it will take time. It will co take commitment by the department to say, you know, this is important. We need you to do this. That's a, that's a, that's a matter of finding the will and influencing the people who, who, who lead. Some of the people are in this room who, who help lead departments or, or universities or colleges. So I think it's just important to just say, this is as important or perhaps even more important than me spending the time thinking about my next grant proposal, for example. So it's, it's just a matter of making a, a, a choice, as, as you're saying. So um, we'll, we'll move on. I, I guess we're, I've, I've gone over time, so I appreciate that. Thank you.
So thank you, David. Let's thank David for his talk.